Hello and welcome to the Nikon Report, your weekly roundup for all the latest Nikon news and all other photograph announcements that we found interesting. It's Constant here. And this is Becky. By the end of the show, our makeup is all going to be down. <laughs> it's hot out here. It is. It's hot in the UK. But we're not complaining because that would be a very British thing to do. So we are complaining actually, because obviously we are true British and Becky, who's Welsh. But... <laughs> A part of the heat in the UK, there's a rumor going around, and at the time of recording, which is Monday, there's a Nikon Z9 film where it's going to come out within 24 hours. The very well-known, with a very sketchy record track of rumors, How To Fly Twitter account reported this rumor. He says Nikon will release a new film where for Nikon Z9 within 24 hours. Okay. And do we also want to say how to fly was actually correct in this instance and a firmware update did come out, but while we're recording, we're just going to go over the changes. In the other multiverse, <laughs> how to fly was completely wrong and you should listen to him and you should really not go to his Twitter account. <laughs> So, so we've got three multiverse options here. And obviously we're going to talk about this firmware update next week on the Negan Report. Now, let's move on to Z8 coverage because apparently nothing came out of Z8, the 24mm 1.7. It was released, people forgot about it, but Z8 is still going. So according to Nikon rumors, there's a huge second shipment is coming to the United States and a lot of people are getting their cameras now. In UK, as far as I know, we had already four shipments. Is that correct, Becky? Uh, yep. First large one and then four smaller shipments. So we've done okay. I think we will expect more in July from what I'm hearing. But the common question that we've been asked, shall I order the camera now? And if I order it now, how many years will I wait for it? For us, you will be waiting a few weeks. So, Is that all? Yeah. So if you are in the UK, if you are a Grey's customer or would like to be a Grey's customer, then you won't be waiting very long at all. In fact, we've had a few people who put in their pre-order who then have been allocated a camera who've gone, oh, that was fast. I'm not ready for it yet. So... Uh, the funds are not there. It's an interesting problem, nice problem to have, I would say, having more stock than we expected. And long may that continue. I hope for our US and Canadian viewers and everywhere else that you get your Z8 very soon. So do you think they can actually learn from Z9 launch and actually produce more shipments? I have a feeling that's what happened, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a huge achievement for Nikon. And obviously combined with improvement in logistics after the COVID. So I think it's all kind of multiplied into the results we have now where people don't really need to wait for too long for their cameras. Now, talking about Japan, apparently the current wait in Japan is about three months. That's according to Asobinet, who reports that the main dealers like Yodabash cameras and MAP cameras have those expected delivery days on their website. So if you're in Japan, three months. If you are in UK and Europe, it seems like it's two to four weeks. And if you're in the United States, it's about a month or so. All right. Next up, AlphaGuard released a Z8 camera skin, the yeah. first of its kind. And those are already available online. So if you would like to customize your Z8, and these are not the silicon skins that we're talking about. We're talking about more kind of... Like a vinyl skins that you kind of attach yeah. to the body of the camera. So if you want your camera to look like this, or like this, then... We won't judge you, really. You can order it directly from AlphaGuard website. It's a judgment-free zone. <laughs> That's right. Now, there are promotions on new Nikon items in the UK, Europe, and also Canada are doing some sales at the moment for our Canadian fellows. So we have summer instant savings here in the UK and Europe, which continue until the 24th of July. And then Canada have rebates. Yeah, and the United States have rebates. There's a lot of rebates, really, to be listed, but we're going to put them on the screen for you. So if you were looking to buy a camera or a lens, perhaps, they're quite a good savings to be had. So, for example, something like Z5 is currently in the United States, retails at $996.95. Plus tax. That's basically under $1,000. And if you are looking to get into full frame, I think it's a fantastic value for money. Indeed. Now let's move on to firmware updates. Nikon Z50 had a firmware update. They updated it to version 2.50. And all it did is that it's added support for the power zoom feature on power zoom lenses. So we only have one power zoom lens at the moment, which is 1228 power zoom DX lens. So... I guess it just been brought up to speed. So if you bought this lens and you have a Z50, then it should be all functioning perfectly right now. 
There you go. Now, Nikon also released firmware updates for the WRR11A and WRR11B wireless remote controllers. They fixed an issue whereby taking photographs in quick succession with either the R11A or R11B and the SB5000 when connected via radio controlled AWL, which is their advanced wireless lighting system, would sometimes produce abnormal images. Now, this is unusually a firmware update that you can do yourself, whereas back in the day, you used to have to send those little remotes off to Nikon for an update. However, unfortunately, those units are discontinued in the UK and Europe, so I don't totally know... <laughs> <laughs> when or if we will ever see anything like it again. Absolutely. You know what else was discontinued or rumored to be discontinued? Mm. Apparently, some Nikon filters, which is called Aircrest, which we haven't seen in UK anyway. No, because they are limited distribution for Japan and apparently the USA. And even Matt Owen did a review on these and we had a lot of customers say, oh, can you get the Aircrest filters? But we can't, unfortunately, over here. So those were launched back in 2017 and they are high performance protection filters that suppresses reflections, but also they were discontinued in Japan, or at least rumored to be discontinued, all sizes now, and that comes from Asobinet. Who knows? Okay, it's a bit of a weird one, that, because we never saw the filters in the first place. So. That's right. So you can't discontinue something that hasn't been released here. Doesn't, doesn't affect us. Speaking of regional releases. Yes. Nikon apparently officially announced a 24mm 1.7 lens in Japan last week and is due to be shipped on 23rd of June. Oh. Reminds me of old regional launches of consoles where you would launch, like Sony would launch a PlayStation in the United States first. And then... And then Japan and then Europe. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, USA, Europe and then Japan. It's like the cat's already out of the bag. Exactly. You know, it didn't age well in the internet era, but, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, I guess. Uh, at least it's not like a year late, so it's just a week late after the announcement. Yes. Okay. Next up, the latest DxO Optics modules now support the Z8, which is fantastic. So if you use DxO software, then you can now have support for the 800mm with and without all the Z converters. That's true. So if you do use DxO software, do update uh, them by their website. Now, since there are not many news around, so we're going to talk about reviews a little bit. And E14 published review of Nikon Z8. And... So here's what they think is good on Nikon Z8. Okay, so the things that they did like were the fact that it's top class quality throughout, superb range of lenses, bristling with features for stills and video, weather sealing to pro standards, the fact that it's got VR in the body, excellent EVF with no blackout, fast and responsive, vibration-free electronic shutter, very important at those high resolutions, true hybrid camera that switches easily between stills and video, less expensive than Z9, but with most of the features, and the fact that it also has SD card compatibility. I like how they put vibration reduction as a pro of Z8. There's like none of the Nikon full-frame sensors had the vibration reduction on Nikon Mirli system. But um, if you're comparing it with other cameras, I think not all full-frame bodies across all other brands have VR on the sensor. Maybe they do, I don't know. I know, I know. I mean, but in this day and age, we kind of expect it. We do. Except on DX bodies, obviously. <clears throat> Nikon. But what's interesting to me, they only put two negatives for this camera. First one is, they call it quite large and heavy, although 30% smaller than Z9. And again, from one of those points, I think that a lot of professionals did ask for a bigger body. Mm. So I don't know if they ask for a heavier body. They definitely ask for the physical bigger size Want of it the to body be itself. Bigger. Obviously, my large hands, the pinky was hanging all the time. And uh, that was a big issue. It was a deal breaker. You know, I couldn't take pictures with other cameras, you know. So literally didn't take any pictures before the day came out. So don't know what I did without it. Um, <laughs> you know, but the second one was the battery life, which is fairly short. Now... Yes and no. I think it depends on what you're comparing it with. Uh, to be honest, we've done loads of tests on battery life performance and we haven't yet gotten to a point where we feel like the battery life is too short. We've done numerous shoots. We've done video with it uh, across several days, thousands of shots. Obviously, the, the Z8 battery and all mirrorless batteries really are more dependent upon how long the camera is functioning for rather than number of shots. So whereas with a DSLR, the battery sort of lasted even if you accidentally left the camera on for a few days, weeks, months. Yes, <laughs> and then it just doesn't power up because... <laughs> Because the battery is dead. Internal battery is dead. However, with the with the mirrorless cameras, and this is across all mirrorless cameras, if you leave the camera on and you don't have the automatic power off set up, then yes, it will eventually drain itself. Yeah, so since we've got our unit, 
So me and Becky now we will be exclusively shooting on Z8 for Cow our owners. videos. <laughs> I kind of went through the menus and there is a battery saving feature for stills photography ah. there. Don't know exactly what the difference is, but I did turn it on. Okay. So we are going to monitor it and hopefully we will see the difference between it turned on or turned off. We'll test it. But yes, if you compare it to Z9 battery, which is A, very expensive, B, a lot bigger and C, a lot heavier, then yes, of course, Z9 battery can last forever. Well, not, but we know people shooting something like 4,000 shots with it and it's still going strong. Again, as Becky mentioned, you can take 2,000 shots in a, let's say, fast frame rate shooting on Z8 and the battery will be still at 50% because it's not about how many pictures you take, but it's actually how long the camera is operating. So if you're just a single shot photographer, it may last you less because obviously you, your camera's fully turned on and you're just walking around the town looking for that shot. So keep that in mind. But overall, I think it's, a, again, another positive review of Z8. If you were contemplating on getting Z8, then yes, it's one of those reviews that we'll definitely convince you to go ahead and order one. Now, there's a YouTube review by Morten Himmler who basically stole your video and shot some macro photography with Nikon Z8. Oh, I think you, Becky, should feel personally attacked. <laughs> I don't feel personally attacked. The more the merrier, but we should definitely do a Z8 macro video. So Morten Himmler says two great custom settings for macro photography specifically. That's on his YouTube channel where he's using the Z8 specifically for macro. We are absolutely without a doubt going to be doing that just so you know I'm i am that. looking forward to that yes he is <laughs> now we also did a review of when you can say that as well as the h5 1.2 which wasn't really a review of h5 and uh, no it wasn't really a review of the 85 because we just kind of threw it in there and we took lots of shots with it let's call it hands-on on h5 z 1.2 but a review of Nick and Z8. So we had a basketball shoot with a Lamar from Survivor by Zion Media and a beautiful model, Khadija. Have a look at that because it's a long one, but we really enjoyed shooting it. Yeah, and we had some interesting conclusions to draw. Lamar is a Z9 user by trade. He uses his Z9 for everything. And so just being able to also see how he, who is a working professional, found the Z8 by comparison. As he said, not to give you a spoiler or anything, but as he said, it's like, you know, I don't feel any learning curve picking up the Z8. And he also really liked the balance of the 85. We took some shots of the 85 1.2. We will have a full review out on that one in a couple of weeks' time as well. Exactly. And also the bonus of that video as well, that Lamar is actually American, so he speaks the English that you can actually understand. There you go. Next up, we have Nikon 400mm Ultimate Lens Comparisons by Wildlife Inspired with Scott Keys. And what does he compare? Well, he compares all the 400mm lenses from Nikon Z lineup. So it's 402.8, 404.5, and two zooms like 100-400 and 70-200-2.8. I guess with a two times teleconverter. Presumably. We actually did a video on 100-400 versus 70-200 with two times teleconverter. So if you haven't seen that, definitely check this out as well because there's some good photographs of deer in there. There are. And last but by no means least, we have the Nikon Z camera lineup comparison, which to buy, who for, an overview by Matt Owen. Extensive video where Matt goes through all Nikon current Z cameras and tells you which one is good, which one is bad, and which one is ugly. Very useful. Spoiler alert, all of them are good, <laughs> but if you don't know which one to get, that would be a good video that will just guide you through the whole range of Nikon Z cameras. Now, since it's been a slow week and there are not many news out, so we need to part our podcast because you like our podcast to be lengthy for at least an hour or two. So what we decided to do is do a point of discussion, something that we do every now and then. And today we're going to talk about owning a several camera systems. Yes, I think this comes about based off of a picture that I put on the internet, on my socials of one of the other cameras that I own that is not a Nikon. And yeah. I had a few direct messages that freaked people out, which was very, very funny because we've never made it a secret that we own multiple cameras. And and to be fair, I actually don't own any digital cameras that aren't Nikon. Yeah. There's no Nikon medium format camera. No, there's no Nikon medium format camera. And I happen to have the opportunity to buy a really, really nice condition, 1950s Leica M2, mm. not at a bank breaking price and I thought you know what I've never owned a Leica I should yeah. quite fancy one of those who needs a house where you can buy a Leica <laughs> I would say it was nowhere near the cost of a house it was very much a bargain and 
I put a picture of that. Now, the thing is, I would love to own a Nikon rangefinder, but mm. A, every time we get one in the shop, someone buys it. <laughs> and B, they're actually, even the Nikon rangefinders that we've had in were more expensive than the cost of my Leica M2. Yeah, so basically in the absence of ultimate rangefinder, we have to get by with Leicas. <laughs> and it's nice. In fact, I think it was because I had seen Sorsten Overgaard, who is a Leica ambassador, mm. some came up on my socials and he does these very kind of like, everything is black and white and everything is kind of edgy and different. And he runs these classes and stuff and I must have had an ad for it. And I was like, oh, why is he a Leica ambassador? Da, da, da. One of my friends had been to one of his workshops and I thought, oh, owning a Leica would be cool. I had another friend who bought a Leica. He's a wedding photographer. He normally uses Canon, but he bought a Leica for one particular job because he charges whatever, like 10 grand a wedding or something like that. He's like, I'm just going to buy a Leica for this one job. I want his job. <laughs> right. And and so I'd seen enough people using them that I thought, oh, I would quite like this. And it's not as expensive as an SP, believe it or not. I don't believe in <laughs> it. Wasn't, it wasn't as expensive as an well, SP. I know, I know. Uh... So... So anyway, the, the point is that I have multiple film cameras from across many, many brands. I have the Pentax 6-7. Obviously, now I have the Leica M2. I still have my Nikon film cameras, including an L35AF and the FM3A. I've got a little Rolly B35. I've got a couple of those Kodak Rito compact point and shoots. I think I've even got a Holger lurking in the back of the cupboard mm. somewhere. So, I mean, I don't understand why that would be a problem for other people, but apparently it is a problem for other people that I don't just own Nikon cameras. And I'm interested to know what your take on it is. Well, I mean, I think the whole point of Nikon exclusive content channel is for us to talk about other brands. <laughs> so let me tell you what I have. Well, I do have like M4P. Okay. So which... Uh, beautiful. Beautiful thing. I mean, much better than you can range finders, let's be honest. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> That's also not necessarily true. But as a, our community, you know, Nikon community, yes, we do love Nikon cameras. And obviously we talk about Nikon brand goods. It doesn't mean that we don't use other cameras in our life. So obviously, you know, I've been shooting Nikon for my whole life. My F100 was my first camera, mm -hmm. but I do shoot with a range of medium format cameras like my Mi RZ and my Mi 7. Mm -hmm. I do even have a Bronica camera, which actually Nikon used to make mm -hmm. lenses for Bronica cameras. I have a large format camera, which is Chamonix, which is a Chinese made uh, large format camera, but I use Nikon large format lenses on it. Yeah. You know, I do shoot on some occasions with the Fujifilm GFX 100S. Yeah every now and then, and uh, for the jobs where I need the high resolution cameras. And there's a reason why I was saying that I need something from Nikon to be that, because I don't want, let's say, to rely on second system yeah. to have. Because one of the things where we should film is a bit different because you generally would buy maybe one camera, one lens, and you kind of stick with that system, you know. Or it's in our case, obviously, <laughs> with a Nikon, you would have a range of lenses, etc. Yes. But if you shoot, let's say, GFX 100S, mm -hmm. and you buy several lenses, that will cost, obviously. Yeah. And in terms of this, it would be wonderful to have two systems like Z8 with all the lenses and then GFX 100S for the high resolution things, but it becomes really, really expensive. Yes. And I also think that by owning different systems, you kind of, you learn where different camera brands have their strengths and weaknesses. I know we have several viewers, well, that, for exactly. example. Unless that, it's Sony and Canon, but otherwise, <laughs> yeah, we agree. Yeah. I know that we have several viewers that actually own multiple systems yeah. professionally and they use them for different reasons. We have people who have Hasselblad systems yeah. alongside their Nikon systems. Obviously, cost is always thing. None of my cameras have cost me a huge amount of money. Like I've been very conscious, budget conscious when I bought my film cameras and the, my most expensive camera out of that selection is my Z6. Yeah, I think if you sell all your film cameras now, you can safely retire and don't work for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's also about timing. But, uh, but I do also think that a little bit like when I was starting to buy, for example, I bought the, the FM2N was my first film camera that I bought when I started working here. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I bought it, FM2Ns weren't fetching a huge amount of money. By the time I went on to sell it and upgrade to the FM3A, FM2Ns had jumped in price. So sometimes it can be considered an investment as well. And I assume that that would be the same for other brands. Yeah, I think one of the reasons of owning multiple systems, of having different brands offering different things. Now, if you look at Nikon, 
Nikon effectively competes with Canon and Sony directly, one-to-one. -one. Yeah. So I don't really see a point of, let's say, owning a Nikon camera and, let's say, having a Canon system or Sony system. And in real life, you probably won't see that. You know, however, if you start to look, let's say, for digital equipment, yeah, if you start to look at uh, something like a GFX system from Fujifilm, and I don't think that's their, let's say, APS-C line, XF, so something like XT5, et cetera. Mm. Like, I think they're competing with the Nikon full-frame system directly, which in my case, I'd rather go full-frame. But once you start to look, look at the medium format mm -hmm. and ultimate resolution, high dynamic range, that's something that Nikon doesn't offer. Right. And that's where GFX system or Hasselblad system comes in. Yes. Obviously, it does cost more, but for professional photographers who need those features particularly, and those obviously cameras won't compete with Nikon on autofocus speed, on frame rate, let's say for sports and action, uh, Nikon system will outperform it. Yes. But for these type of shoots where you need a high dynamic range and resolution, GFX system or Hasselblad system would be a very beneficial. Very similar with the rangefinder approach, you mm -hmm. know. So for some of you who like rangefinder system, like me, mm -hmm. I've started with M7 and I didn't look back. This is my favorite camera and probably the most used camera right now. Mm -hmm. That led to me to look into Leica. Right. And again, I got M4P at the same time as you did. Mm -hmm. And this is what I use for my street photography right now. This is the camera with the 28 on. Yeah. And it's literally, that's all I shoot with it. Mm -hmm. I don't shoot anything else with it. it. It's basically, it's with me. 28 is glued to it. Yeah. The Voigtlander 28 Ultron is superb. And I'm not going to go and shoot, let's say, professional work or some like interior shot with it. You no, know, sure. You need to have an Nikon system for that. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's the reason why you would look into different systems because you can't have an ultimate camera, per se, that gives everything to everyone. There's always complaining about something. Always. Z8 is not big enough as Z9. The battery is too small. Z9 is too big and too heavy. Or, you know, so it's like there's not a perfect camera for anyone, you no. know. And if you start to look at this, it makes sense to get certain cameras and obviously... Being in a position to be able to get certain cameras, yeah. it's nice to have. And uh, what we want to ask the people in the comments below is say, do you own a multiple brand cameras or systems? Not necessarily like three, five lens per system or something like that. But let's say, do you own Nikon and some other brand as your maybe second camera or as your potentially a backup camera or fun camera? It's a good question. And I would add to that, if you do own multiple systems, do you have them for different purposes and different jobs like we often do? Like if we're going out somewhere where most of our digital equipment is very, very heavy, I'm not also then going to carry a Pentax 6.7 with me. But I do. I do carry my Mamiya 7. Though. I know you do. <laughs> Sometimes I have done that. I have carried my Pentax with me on shoots where I've got six cameras in my bag by the end of the day. And I think for me... The two systems that I have the most lenses for, Nikon 100%, I have more lenses for my Nikons than any other camera system. And then Pentax, I've got like four lenses for. And everything else is either built-in lens or one lens for my Leica M2, which is the Voigtlander 40mm f1.2, which is very nice. And I would just be interested to know if our viewers and listeners also have a similar kind of idea of, well, I have a camera for this job and then I have a camera for this purpose and I don't mind having multiple brands as and when I can get hold of them, particularly if you can find one at a bargain. I did get asked on Instagram, actually, after I'd posted that picture, someone said, oh, are you going to do videos on your other cameras? I'd love to see a video on, you know, the other systems that you own. And obviously we wouldn't necessarily do that on our YouTube channel, but we did do a medium format film video. We did. We did. We did. It was short, it was sweet, and obviously Nikon don't produce any medium format cameras and never did, so we couldn't talk about those. But once in a while, once in a blue moon, I think it's okay to venture out. Maybe we'll do a comparison between the SP and the Leica. Absolutely. At the end of the day, while this is a Nikon-only channel, we also photographers ourselves yes and we love to take photographs with whatever cameras we have yeah. more than anything else and i hope you share this passion with us as do i do let us know in the comments below let us know <laughs> and that's a wrap thanks for joining us this week yes thank you very much for watching and or listening please give us a like and a subscribe if you're on youtube give us a follow rating review etc if you are on spotify or one of the other podcast platforms yeah, let me name the other two. It's uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, Amazon Unlimited, Amazon Music, 
And there's YouTube as well. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. Apparently, in the United States, there's a podcast available on YouTube Music. Hopefully, it will come everywhere else in the world. But if you're United States and you would like to listen to us instead of watching, then we are available there as well. Do leave us reviews and ratings there because it's important for this podcast to grow. Yes, and if you'd like to attack me on the internet for my choice of cameras, you can find me at Rebecca underscore Danese on Instagram. Let's be honest, it's a wonderful choice of cameras. <laughs> you need my Mia 7 though. I do, I need a Mia 7 in my life. You can find the shop at Nikon at Grays. And I'm at Konstantin Koshkin. We do publish the samples of the images that we take of the lens that we reviews on this channel. So if you want to have a look at those, definitely go there. And we will see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. Stay hydrated. Stay hydrated, folks. <laughs> Don't melt into a puddle on the floor like us. I think I'm overheating. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're talking about other brands on this podcast. <laughs>